Today, we're gonna to be talking about aliens and everyone's favorite ranch, and not the Ram Ranch. I'm Aiden Mattis, and welcome back to the Lore Lodge. A few years ago, during the pandemic, Skinwalker Ranch became very, very popular. As in, it was all over the internet for a while there. In fact, the popularity of TV shows and movies like Hunt for the Skinwalker and The Secrets of Skinwalker Ranch are kind of what created the atmosphere that allowed us to launch this channel in the first place, because for those of you who might not have been around since the very beginning, my very first viral TikTok video was about Skinwalkers. Now, the ranch itself has some pretty interesting stories, even without the Skinwalker issue, but the history and and the cultural aspects are also important to the mythos surrounding this property. Historically, this area in northeastern Utah was shared, contested, and just generally split between the Ute and the Navajo peoples, both Native Americans, but from different Native American groups. Despite the fact that these two tribal nations lived essentially right next to each other, they come from entirely different stock. The Ute speak a Uto-Aztecan language and originated somewhere in the southwestern or western United States, whereas the Navajo actually speak a Nadene language and are from very, very far to the north. While linguistics and ethnicity are not inextricably linked, you do often see a language follow an ethnic group, and then eventually it might diffuse through programs like colonialism, empire, and other such. But in this case, we're talking about something that you can kind of think of as similar to the difference between the Anglo-Saxons and the Celts in Britain. Two different groups, both European, but different languages living in the same area, and of course there was going to be conflict. We don't know particularly the exact location from which the Navajo emerged, but there is a possibility that a group of people who are said to have disappeared, called the Naha, who of course are from Nahani River Valley, that they might be the ancestors of the Navajo. Now, etymologically, Navajo and Naha are not linked. The Navajo referred to themselves as a Dene people. But there was a Dene-speaking group from Nahani River Valley that sometime in the distant past, according to legend, disappeared essentially overnight. Now, in order to disappear, they would have to leave. Around 1300 or 14 1500 AD, the Navajo and the Apache, or at least their ancestors, show up in the southwestern United States in the Four Corners region. And we know this from the Pueblo people who say that they weren't there the whole time because the Pueblo were there the whole time. Initially, having made a very long march down from northern Canada, the Navajo lived as raiders and traders, as well as some subsistence agriculture. Their trading nature brought them into contact with a lot of tribes, but their raiding nature brought them into conflict with a lot of tribes. However, by the 1800s, they were a generally settled agriculturalist people. They actually learned a considerable amount of their agricultural techniques from the Pueblo people, because of course, any agriculture that worked in northern Canada was probably not gonna work in Utah. Despite learning a lot from the Pueblo, however, the Navajo maintained kind of an adversarial relationship and often did run raids against the, the Pueblo. The Pueblo actually ended up changing around some of their religious festivals to avoid Navajo raiding season, so contentious to say the least. Problems for the Navajo between themselves and the other tribes were typically of a small nature. You didn't see a ton of massive wars, not a ton of huge territorial displacement, and on a few occasions, the Navajo sided with the Ute, their neighbors, against the encroaching United States. In 1860, however, the Navajo found themselves on the wrong end of the war with the United States, with the Ute actually siding with the Americans. Now, why particularly they did this is unclear, but it may, seem, it may have seemed to them that they could spare themselves some of the treatment that they had seen of those who resisted further east by siding against the Navajo. Of course, it didn't really work out for either tribe. The Navajo lost that war, which resulted in their own version of the Trail of Tears on a much smaller scale, known as the Long Walk, where they were forced to walk over 300 miles to a completely different location that was not equipped for their needs. There were 9,000 people sent along on the trip. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough water when they got there. They didn't have enough supplies or tools to make shelters. A lot of people died. There was a lot of sickness. Very, very bad time. Eventually, several years later, those who survived the Long Walk and their imprisonment in a different location ended up going back to their homeland, which at this point was significantly reduced to what is now just the Navajo Nation. The Ute did come out of this on top for the time, getting a ton of land in northeastern Utah that previously they had to share or compete with the Navajo for. The Navajo ended up primarily to the south. And if legend is to be believed, the Navajo did not take kindly to this. They didn't want the Ute to be able to use that land that they 
had essentially stolen from the Navajo people. And, again, this is according to legend, and I'm not even saying it's necessarily according to Navajo legend, but there is a story that the Navajo cursed the land to be the path of the skinwalker, so that the Ute would have to be looking over their shoulders at all times as a whole bunch of skinwalkers hunted all of their people. Now, where this originated is unclear to me. I can't find an original version of the story on the internet. It could very well have been made up as part of the local area's mythos, but again, I'm not sure. But, again, according to the story, the Skinwalkers hang out in a location called Dark Canyon, which is not too far from Ballard, Utah, and the nearby Skinwalker Ranch. In general, they are haunting, or said to haunt, the entire Uintah Basin. And you might be wondering, what's in the Uintah Basin? Obviously, Skinwalker Ranch. But before we get into the details of the ranch, it's probably important to talk about what Skinwalkers actually are, because there is a good chance that you came and sat down to this video, especially if you're new to our channel, with kind of a misconception about this topic. So, skinwalkers, which is something that I've been generally familiar with since the early 2010s due to various paranormal boards, Reddit, 4chan, iFunny, things like that, those went viral again in 2020, 2021. They, they made it out of the creepypasta community and onto TikTok, and that just blew the gates wide open. Everyone's dog was a skinwalker, skinwalkers were hunting you in your suburban development, the Amazon delivery driver was a skinwalker, and unfortunately, most people, including myself at the time, I'm had the entire concept of skinwalkers completely incorrect. Skinwalkers are not inhuman monsters capable of transforming into any given form they choose. They cannot transform into your Amazon delivery driver, they're not gonna transform into your dog, that's just not the way it works, and as far as location, chances are you're not encountering something that is part of specifically Navajo folklore outside of the Four Corners region. Especially because it's a closed practice held within the Navajo culture, so you're not gonna find people who aren't Navajo being skinwalkers. And of Navajo people you meet, even the ones that would be skinwalkers wouldn't want to tell you that, and those who know skinwalkers also wouldn't want to tell you that because it's taboo. They're also often mixed up with the Wendigo, the Fleshgate, the Rake, the Goatman, and generally any shape-shifting creatures, especially those that the internet got a hold of. Those would be things like the Rake, the Goatman, and the Fleshgate, which we've talked about all three of those actually on this channel if you want to go check out those videos. But those aren't skinwalkers. They do take some little bits and pieces from skinwalkers, like mimicry and, and such, but in general, not quite the same thing. In Navajo lore, what they actually are is medicine men who practice bad medicine. In kind of the Western canon of understanding and folklore, you would think about this as kind of uh, dark magic, bad magic, witches. And witches specifically in the, like, evil witches sense. We're not talking about kind of the... Like, we're not talking about Wiccans here, that's a different kind of thing. This is specifically witches who practice bad magic, magic that hurts people. Thing is, what exactly they're capable of is kind of hard to figure out. The Navajo consider this a closed practice, some will be willing to talk to you about it, others will be very closed off. I've had conversations with probably half a dozen different Navajo individuals who have given me generally the same story, but on occasion there are contradictions between one another. So what I'll be doing here is presenting you kind of a range of options that I've been told by Navajo individuals can apply to the Skinwalker, but they might not necessarily be universal to the lore. It might vary from tribe to tribe within the Navajo Nation. I'm not sure if I've used quite the right terminology there, but I, th I think you get what I'm saying. One example of this variance is that some people I've talked to have the story that Skinwalkers can transform into, that they physically transform into an animal. So, and it's a super, a super animal. So they're gonna become a large wolf with red glowing eyes, and black fur that can run at 70 miles per hour and knock on your window while you're driving down the highway. In other cases, it's more of a spiritual transformation, kind of like what you'd see with Viking Berserkers. Skinwalkers would be a similar thing. And that, that idea of spiritual shape-shifting is not specific only to the Navajo, which is why I'm inclined to believe that that is probably the more accurate interpretation, but again, I'm not positive. So in theory, the latter sort, those who transform in spirit, would appear, they would put on pelts and they might even have a hodgepodge of different animals as camouflage. So the idea would be that A, you would be spiritually taking on the, the form of that animal. So you might get some of its instincts, its powers. And on the other hand, you would be wearing their pelts as camouflage, which might help you in battle. It might help you with hunting, stalking, something like that. And some versions are kind of a middle ground where there's 
small transformations. Somebody might grow fangs and claws, have sort of, you know, a, a wolf pelt on their back. Again, it, it varies. Astral projection is also mentioned in some cases, the idea that you can have your soul leave your body and roam around the world, as well as the belief that they can travel through the astral plane, either bringing their physical presence along with them, or just to go and spy on people. And that's one of those ones that I saw a few times, heard a few times, but was not universal. And then there's another issue with skinwalkers that comes up a lot of the time, cannibalism. And from what I can tell, cannibalism is absolutely not a requirement of the process of becoming a skinwalker. It seems that this may have developed from people mixing up the Wendigo with the skinwalker. The Wendigo, of course, is all about cannibalism. That's, that's the whole point of Wendigos, is in order to be one, you must commit an act of cannibalism, and you don't want to become a Wendigo. Skinwalker is a deliberate choice, but so far as I can tell when it comes to the process of if somebody chooses, you know, I, I want to take the risk that I will be ostracized or even killed by my community in order to gain these powers, there are, there are a number of ways to do that that I've come across. There does appear to be a certain community aspect, and a Skinwalker must be taught and initiated by another Skinwalker. Another facet is that a violent crime must be committed against somebody who is important to you. Basically, you have to commit an act of severe betrayal. This often could be killing a family member or a close friend. And I, I think this is maybe where cannibalism worked its way in because that would that would do it, would probably be over the top even, but it would do it. It also seems likely that there is some sort of use of psychedelics, some spiritual journey involved where you're supposed to go and investigate your inner self and possibly meet with higher entities and go on something of a, a spiritual journey. So again, not surprising. This is something we've seen all over the world is that people who are doing shamanistic rituals, and that's what these would be, is these are shamans to an extent, what we see around the world is that, yeah, a lot of the time they use psychedelics to communicate with the spiritual world. And before the CIA got tired of using psychedelics and decided nobody else was going to be allowed to do it, their use in medicine was also pretty widespread. Like seriously, the CIA was like, what if we used psychedelics to convince Charles Manson to commit murder and then told everybody else it's dangerous? Remember kids, the next time that somebody tells you the government wouldn't do that, oh yes they would. And as far as doing the actual transformation goes, the skinwalker has to kill, skin, and then wear the pelt of an animal. Once all of that is done, supposedly the skinwalker can transform at will, possibly needing the actual pelt to do so, which again, very interesting because this ties into a lot of werewolf legends from Europe. And again, I'm hearing this specifically from the Navajo side. So it's kind of cool to see the ways that interestingly, you know, the Navajo and certain things like werewolves in Europe, originally werewolves, if you read some of the older werewolf stories, it's not that they were transforming because of the full moon. They transform by putting on some sort of garment or by taking off garments. Uh, this claverit, for example, does involve the moon, but also in order to get out of werewolf form, he has to put his clothes back on. Uh, the Lay of Melion, which might be the inspiration for this claverit, that one has a similar uh, issue at hand. I think it's a belt that he takes on and off. And then, of course, we need to talk about motivation, and the primary motivator for skinwalkers seems to be personal power, ambition, wealth, things like that. And it's a balancing act, because these people who are seeking to accumulate earthly wealth and power through the manipulation of sort of spiritual world ideas, they have to keep the means by which they're doing this secret, all while exercising the benefits in public. This is kind of reflected in the fact that skinwalkers cannot be open about their identity as skinwalkers for fear that they will be killed or ostracized by their community. Because you have to remember, even if the skinwalker has done nothing wrong since becoming a skinwalker, in order to get to that point, they had to commit a, a horrible crime. So every skinwalker is by definition a murderer. A less common but equally relevant factor in this could also be revenge. Somebody might be wronged by somebody more powerful than them, and becoming a skinwalker is a way to level the playing field so that they can get revenge. But worry not, because as powerful as they are supposed to be, these guys do have weaknesses. Those weaknesses are very specific, but they are, they are there. 
While a shaman, a medicine man, somebody like that would have more tools available to them, the average person, should you be concerned that you are in fact being hunted by a skinwalker, should know that there are some ways to ward them off. For example, burning sage, cedar wood, things like that. Very heavily scented things that skinwalkers don't like. Additionally, there is also white ash, and that is not the white ash tree. That is white ashes from a fire, and what you do is you coat either a blade or a bullet, whatever weapon you're going to be using, with those ashes, and it seems that that somehow breaks the sort of magical force field that these guys are supposed to have. But you do have to get it in the head or the heart, because otherwise it, it can survive. These guys can survive dismemberment. So, you may be asking, these skinwalkers have a whole ranch? Sort of. Skinwalker Ranch is something of a misnomer, though skinwalker sightings have definitely been reported there. The history of the ranch property goes back to 1905, but the history of the current homestead that is there dates back to 1934 when it was built by Ken and Edith Myers. It is located southeast of the Utah town of Roosevelt and just around, just on the border with the Uinta Ure Reservation. And that of course makes this Ute territory. And the Ute are the people who are supposed to be cursed with the skinwalker, so that makes sense. The Myers family owned the property until 1994, and as far as I can tell, they never reported anything odd. In fact, the last person to own the property on the Myers side said that nothing strange ever happened there in interviews later on. There are suggestions that the neighbors said weird things happened, but a lot of it is hearsay. In fact, I didn't find any hard evidence, no police reports, no photographic evidence, no videos, not even somebody going to the newspaper. In 1994, it was sold to Terry and Gwen Sherman, and that is when the weird stuff began. And of course, in this case, we're talking about the very weird stuff, because this is Utah and there's already weird stuff going on there. What do I mean by that? Well, an NIH paper from 1985 suggests a strong temporal correlation between the numbers of reports of UFOs and nearby seismic activity for the year 1967, which A, suggests that UFO sightings were extremely frequent in the year 1967, as well as the fact that there were enough UFO sightings that the National Institute of Health decided to look into it. Now, that said, Hill Air Force Base is just 125 miles by air from Skinwalker Ranch, and Area 51 is just 380 air miles from Skinwalker Ranch. Both of these have been used to test experimental aircraft. And that, it, that has actually been the explanation given for a lot of UFO sightings all over the American Southwest is, oh, sorry, our bad, that was the B-17, like, won't happen again. And when you look at a lot of what's reported, well, we talk about stationary aircraft in the sky that then suddenly move in a different direction. That could be explained by vertical takeoff and landing technology, VTOL. There's a number of other possibilities, and I am sure there is stuff the government has that they are not telling us about. A lot of people pointed to the strange shape of the aircraft that they were seeing. For example, some were round, but of course we have had round experimental aircraft. For example, the Vought V-173 flying pancake. Other UFO sightings have been described as triangular, which of course, as we know, there were a whole bunch of flying wings being tested. The two that are most famous being the B-2 and the, B the B-117. Some people reported cigar-shaped aircraft, and there have been a number of cigar-shaped planes, as well as basically any missile test. And in some cases, they described very large ovular objects, either stationary or slowly moving through the sky, which of course sounds a lot like a Zeppelin. My point here is not to say aliens can't possibly exist, but that if you're looking at reports of strange aircraft, right where they test all the strange looking aircraft, there's a good chance you're seeing strange aircraft, but they aren't necessarily from off planet. Terry and Gwen Sherman, however, ran into something entirely different when they bought the ranch in 1994 and proceeded to move their two children as well as a bunch of livestock onto it. Their first day there, the Shermans reported seeing a very large wolf or coyote stalk its way up to a cattle pen, reach through the bars with its mouth, and grab a calf. And it was trying to drag the calf out of the pen, but of course the bars were getting in the way. Terry and his father ran over and started beating at the wolf with shovels. It still wouldn't let go. And eventually Terry took out a 357 Magnum and just shot the wolf at point blank. And according to Terry, it, it didn't bother the wolf at all. So he shot the wolf again with the 357 Magnum and the wolf calmly walked away. You ought to see me with a 357 Magnum. I'm awesome. 
And, you know, you might be thinking, it's possible a wild animal took two shots from a revolver and walked away. But the weird part is, according to Terry uh, Sherman, the wolf didn't appear injured at all. There was no sign of blood, it wasn't limping, it didn't yelp, it just kind of looked at him, looked offended, walked off, and then they stalked it for a little while, only to find that the tracks just stopped suddenly as it approached the tree line, as if it just disappeared. That bit right there sounds a lot like a skinwalker, because what are we dealing with here? It is a odd-shaped or overly large predatory animal. It is impervious to weapons, normal weapons. It suddenly stopped leaving coyote tracks. And you might think about it, you know, if they were looking for coyote or wolf tracks and those transitioned into being human footprints, they might not catch that. That might, that might just not even cross their minds. Also, there's the whole astral plane issue. And to be clear, they said it was either a wolf or a coyote. It looked like a wolf or coyote. It, it's unclear which one it even was, but if the story is true, it was probably neither. Another similar sighting happened to Gwen Sherman, who was in her car when she saw a large wolf. And when we're talking large wolf, she said that its shoulders reached the top of her window, just standing next to the car. So we're clear about that. The average gray wolf stands about 30 inches tall at the shoulder, and the average sedan is about five feet tall. So this wolf would have been about twice the size of a normal gray wolf. Additionally, there have only been 15 to 20 wolf sightings in Utah since 1995. Wolves do not exist in Utah, at least not as a permanent population. To clarify what that means is that there is no consistent wolf pack living in Utah. There are some that range in from neighboring states, but there's not one that seems to make Utah its permanent or uh, primary home. Alongside that, she also reported that there was a smaller, unidentifiable canine that was with the wolf. Another sighting of this sort involved another canine attacking a horse this time. It was described as low to the ground, weighing about 200 pounds, with red curly hair and a bushy tail. According to Terry, it simply vanished as he approached, and when he went to look at the horse, it had several claw marks on it. Then, correlating with some UFO sightings, they had seven different cows vanish, and four just were never seen again, while three were found, but they were found partially mutilated. One had a hole bored through its left eye, one had a hole in its left eye and a six inch wide, one inch deep hole bored through its rectum. Rectum? Damn near killed him! Did kill him. The weirdest one is the third one, which according to Terry, his son had seen just five minutes before they found it dead. And that one had a, uh, a six inch wide, 18 inch hole bored through its rectum into its body cavity. None of the cows had any trace of bleeding. There was a chemical scent around all three and there were no signs of any predators around, no tracks whatsoever. Now, of course, cattle mutilations are one of those things that get reported every time there are UFO sightings. I, I, I'm not a big aliens person, to be honest, but, you know, I, I, I do recognize a pattern. As far as the cows that vanished, they rode their horses all over the place looking for these cows, trying to find them, and in one case, they found the tracks for the cow, and they just went on into a, a spot where there was a whole bunch of twigs arranged in a circle, the tops of the trees had been cut off, and the cow appeared to have just been lifted out of the snow. Its tracks just stopped. But not everything that the Shermans reported was paranormal. A 1996 article in Salt Lake City's Deseret News details the reports of the Shermans, and according to that article, it is the first time they had ever spoken publicly about the events. They had a whole bunch of UFO sightings to report, and one of those sightings included a small box-like aircraft with a white light, a 40-foot long object, and a huge ship the size of several football fields. Anything but the metric system, ladies and gentlemen. They also reported an aircraft that launched a wavy red light beam as it flew, as well as airborne lights that emerged from orange circular portals in midair. Two of the sightings were allegedly videotaped, but I can't find that footage anywhere, and I, I might know why that footage isn't publicly available, and we'll get to that later in the video. But the one that has me most intrigued about that isn't the alien spacecraft, because as we addressed, there is a very solid chance that all of that was experimental aircraft, or actually was weather balloons. I, I know, I know weather balloons is a lame answer, but again, I'm working with what was verifiable information here. The one that has me really intrigued is the floating white lights emerging from glowing orange portals. And before I get to that one, I do want to remind myself, before I forget about this, that there 
are other stories about there being deadbolts on all the doors when they got there and sort of just weird precautions and security measures that have been taken around the homestead. But Garth Myers, the guy who they bought the ranch from in 1994, has said that there weren't deadbolts on all the doors and he didn't have a bunch of weird security measures in the house and that the Shermans just seem to have made that up. You can't, it's, it's impossible to say who's correct because nobody has that evidence. As far as the floating lights though, I'm intrigued. If they're not lying, that does not sound like any experimental technology that I can find on any public source. Now, I personally have long been of the belief that we are more likely to discover and encounter interdimensional beings than we are extraterrestrial beings simply due to the vastness of space. But I, I'm, you know, I'm open. I don't, I don't say no to anything without concrete proof. And part of the reason for that is that I am aware of what wormholes are, or at least I have a summary knowledge of how wormholes work. If aliens were to arrive, it seems likely that they would do so through a wormhole because that would cut the amount of travel distance to a fraction of what it would be otherwise. Wormholes were first theorized in 1916, and in 1935, Einstein and Rosen theorized how this might actually work. Basically, they, they came up with the mathematical evidence that bridges through space-time were possible. I am no physicist, so don't quote me, but from what I understand from reading some science websites is that a natural wormhole, one that forms in space of its own volition, likely would not be navigable simply because they're not stable enough. They are very likely to collapse and therefore traveling through one would be extraordinarily dangerous. However, if you could create them, if you had a process to organize the necessary physical concepts to create a passage through space-time, then you might be able to know exactly how long you have to get through it, in which case a temporary functional wormhole could be generated. However, wormholes in space are one thing. Wormholes between points on Earth? That seems a little bit more complicated. I am not well-versed enough in quantum physics to tell you if that's remotely possible. In fact, I'm not well-versed enough in regular physics to even understand what I'm currently talking about. So I would, I would recommend like going and checking out Kyle Hill's channel or something because he seems to have a better handle on this. But my thinking was, you know, I'm gonna put on my, my you know, how to create better weapons hat and ask the question, if we could create, if we were trying to create wormholes to get around in space, might one step be to try and use, just to see if on Earth we can use wormholes to get from one point to another. Very difficult to test a wormhole in space because you've got to open a very large, you know, again, I don't know enough about what I'm talking about. My, basically, what I'm trying to say is that my thought process was maybe the government thought, hey, can we make wormholes on Earth? If so, that would make it very easy to invade places from places you wouldn't expect. So perhaps that they tried to create something like that and then shoved a drone through it. That was about the only thing I could think of. That's probably entirely impossible, but you know what? I had, I don't know. I'm just imagining the situation in which they may have even considered doing that. And that's like Oppenheimer yep. on roids. Yeah. That's like, remember that one bit of that movie where it was like, there's a near zero chance that we could ignite the atmosphere and destroy mm -hmm. the world. This is a near zero chance of opening up a black hole on Earth. Yeah, yeah. like I feel like that's even mm -hmm. more concerning, but that's just yeah. me. I wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine that opening up a miniature black hole on Earth for the purpose of sticking a Navy SEAL team where China doesn't want it is probably not the best course of action. But I mean, this was 1994, and what else was the US government doing in 1994, Aiden? The Gulf War. Ruby Ridge, Waco were also around that same time. Another claim they made was in regards to mystery circles, as they called them. In this case, the, the most obvious ones were three eight foot in diameter circles that were triangularly arranged about 30 feet from one another. Additional circles were found that were perfectly round, three feet wide, and two feet deep. Terry Sherman also claims that at one point while he was out and about with the dogs, he heard voices, male voices, talking about 25 feet above him that the dogs were absolutely frantic and that he could not for the life of him see where the voices were coming from. The Shermans were certain that their cattle mutilations and the UFO appearances were 100% correlated. Those were related. He didn't necessarily allege that the UFOs were doing the cattle mutilations, but these things were definitely happening at the same time. They are connected. I will say I am a bit skeptical of this one because he claims that he wasn't the only one with cattle mutilations, that tons of other farmers were having them, and yet there were no police reports made. There was not a single one made during the period that the Shermans lived there, not from them, not from anybody else. And the reason I say that is that if you were to be making something up, 
calling the cops about the cattle mutilation would be a little difficult because if the cattle mutilation didn't happen, the cops would know. Officials would have to look at the corpses and then at that point it's, you know, they're gonna know if the cattle mutilation happened the way you said it did because the corpse will either have it or not have it. And then it's on the record and then it's no longer that you're telling a cool story to the media, it's that now you've gotta prove it actually happened and that could just be a problem. I'm not saying that it's impossible that it happened, I'm just saying that I have yet to see any evidence that it did. One interesting detail to me was that Terry Sherman said most of the sightings happened when it was either stormy or overcast and during a new moon. So these would be times when the sky is at its darkest. He also claims that at one point he kind of accidentally communicated with one of the craft, which got low enough that he was able to wave his arms at it, and then it blinked its lights three times at him and disappeared. I will make a, a point here that one alleged event that Terry Sherman was out with, that the dogs ran off chasing some sort of orb of light into the woods and they couldn't find them. They, he heard the dogs panicking and then go quiet and the next morning they went outside and all they could find of the dogs was some scorch marks with greasy lumps of flesh. Uh, that, that would have happened before the article was published and yet it does not appear in the article. So I'm not entirely sure if that one was a later creation or not. It seemed possible that that was added into the mythos. Now, a lot of sources do confirm that the Shermans did not seem excited about this. They weren't trying to monetize it. It may be that they were actually experiencing something strange because they were getting ready to sell the property. They, you know, maybe it was just that they didn't like living there and they wanted to talk it up in hopes that somebody with an interest in the paranormal would buy it off them or maybe they genuinely wanted to get out of there. Doesn't matter, all of their problems were solved because a guy named Robert Bigelow decided after reading about this from George Knapp as well as possibly in Deseret News that, oh, you know what, I'm going to buy that property because I am interested in UFOlogy. Thing is, Bigelow offered them $200,000 for the ranch under the condition that they sign an NDA, which may explain why none of the footage that they claim to have is available online. Bigelow made his money as a real estate investor but his true passion was aerospace. He wanted to do space travel. That was his goal. He fully believed in aliens. And the thing is, much like me, he knew he was bad at math and decided to pursue money so he could hire the people that were good at math to find those things out for him. Additionally, Bigelow had founded the National Institute for Discovery Science in 1995, and this was a really solid chance to give his team something with a backstory, some concrete sightings, things like that, and see what they could come up with. Unfortunately, over the course of about eight years, despite pouring money into this, having teams there full time, running all sorts of tests, Bigelow's team was unable to come up with any concrete evidence that anything strange was going on at the ranch. They were able to show some anomalies in certain readings, but nothing that was definitive. There were no verifiable sightings of UFOs, skinwalkers, any sort of other weirdness like the floating orbs. There were no recorded sounds of the alleged underground machinery. And as far as unusual readings went, there was nothing completely inexplicable or definitively unusual. Bigelow, who was not willing to let his project die, but also unwilling to continue funding it himself, decided to seek government help to go to the, to take what he had, the findings he had collected, so he could go to the US government and say, hey, look, we think we're onto something. We need your resources. We don't have the security clearances we need. Can you guys help us? Maybe there are things that you know about that we don't. And shockingly, he did manage to get Republican Senator Ted Stevens and Democratic Senator Daniel Inouye to lobby the then majority leader, Harry Reid, to start a government-sponsored UFO hunt program at Skinwalker Ranch. So he did the impossible and got bipartisanship to happen. And he did it with aliens. Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid went on to initiate the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program, which was not classified, but it was also never publicized. So they started it and didn't tell anybody. They also didn't say nobody can know about this, but nobody knew about it because nobody, nobody was told about it. And I bring that up for a reason, which is that if you look back at the last decade or two, Congress and government in general has a habit, especially in the United States, of every time something important is going on that they don't want us paying attention to, trotting out aliens. Very recently, Congress held a completely uninteresting, unenlightening, and useless hearing on spacecraft, UFOs, all of that, in which they basically told us there was organic material on some stuff that fell out of the sky, and when they asked, were there pilots? They said it was 
non-human or non-terrestrial organics or biologics or something like that, basically a bunch of word salad, if they had found non-human beings in aircraft, they would have said, we found pilots. They didn't say we found pilots. They found every way to be as vague as possible in a congressional hearing that was clearly intended to confirm or deny the existence of aliens. Now, what's going on right now? Both the major presidential candidates are facing legal trouble. So, of course, there's aliens again. I say that because in April of 2020, the Pentagon confirmed, oh, oops, yeah, uh, some of that stuff that was released, those, those Navy UFO videos from 2017, yeah, those are real. Sorry, guys, we shouldn't have kept that secret. And what was going on in April of 2020? We were realizing that we didn't have a certain disease as under control as we thought we did. Another previous mention was in March of 2018 when uh, Harry Reid was interviewed and said, oh, yes, uh, that whole alien thing from, from earlier in the, the decade, that was very real. I told you guys about the aliens. I, I told you so much about the aliens back then. And what was happening then? Well, Russia had just done a, a, a bit of a goofy move and gotten its diplomats expelled from over 20 countries. I'm not saying that aliens aren't real. I'm also not saying that the government is trying to hide stuff from you. I'm just saying that it's a little funny to me that every time there's an important political event that they don't want us thinking about, there's aliens again. And to be very clear, both the Republicans and the Democrats have done this on numerous occasions. This is not partisan. It's just the government being silly and goofy. And the reason I bring that up in the context of the Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program is that that wasn't publicized, which means that that was not to cover for something else. That was not some sort of smoke screen, some red herring, so that the population wasn't thinking about something else that was going on. Although it was started in 2007, but the lobbying started with like in 2005. This was not like they were trying to cover up the 2008 recession. This was something that was in the works and they were doing for the sake of doing it, and they didn't publicize it. This does not scream a distraction to me, like so many of these other sightings do. They kept it quiet without keeping it secret, and a very real bipartisan alien hunting bill was signed. The program ran from 2007 to 2012. It spent about $22 million, and Senator Harry Reid has said that they shared about 80% of their findings publicly and just nobody listened. Eventually, the program was acknowledged by the government officially under the Trump administration in 2017. And yes, there were silly, goofy things in 2017 as well, like us launching missiles into Syria when we weren't supposed to be doing that. But if you thought it was already as weird as it could possibly get, I promise you it isn't. It seems that a major force behind a lot of this government acknowledgement of UFOs has been Tom DeLonge of Blink-182. How do I know that? It's not just to the stars, his organization for that, or all of the songs he wrote about aliens or angels and airwaves. It's the fact that leaked emails between Tom DeLonge, the lead singer of Blink-182, and John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign manager, admit that if Clinton were to win the election, she would tell everybody about the aliens. Real email between two people who just should not cross paths about aliens. I don't think that the years 2016 through 2020 were real. I think we all experienced some sort of mass hallucination. In fact, no year since 2016 has felt real. <laughs> we should have known something was off when we had Pokemon and Blink-182 in 2016. Pokemon go to the polls. When Harambe died, the timeline shifted. So we're in this very interesting spot where both political parties have used aliens as a smokescreen to cover for themselves, and both parties have also launched legitimate investigations into UFOs. So they're, they're playing a weird game here where they're like, you know, Oh, look at the UFOs. We're secretly researching the actual UFOs. I'm gonna preface what I'm about to say by saying it's one of the weirdest things I've ever written, but when Luis Elizondo, the AAITP director, resigned to go work for Tom DeLonge, he told my cousin, Secretary of Defense James Mattis, that uh, there was compelling evidence that we may not be alone. So uh, I wanna again make something clear. The Advanced Aviation Threat Identification Program was a government program, which means Luis Elizondo was a government official who went to the Secretary of Defense to tell him there were probably aliens. In case anybody is going to say what several people have already said on past videos, no, I am not closely related to James Mattis. We share the same paternal ancestor five generations back. And no, I am not a CIA asset and we are not controlled opposition. We do not make enough money to be controlled opposition. My integrity is worth more than your fiat currency, feds.
As far as the ranch, however, goes, because that's what this video is actually about, well, that was sold to Adamantium Holdings LLC, which is the most Hollywood name I've ever heard for anything, and I think that was back in 2016. At that point, it immediately underwent massive security upgrades, like the kind that it had never seen before. Additionally, that LLC's trademark applies to providing recreational facilities, as well as entertainment services, namely creation, development, production, and distribution of multimedia content, internet content, motion pictures, and television shows. So, Adamantium Holdings, which is run by Brandon Fugal, they basically bought it to monetize it, which is why there is so much security, which is why you're starting to see all of these Skinwalker Ranch TV shows and movies and people are licensing stuff. And for me, this is frustrating because there is absolutely no way that I can trust a single thing that comes out of Skinwalker Ranch ever again, as long as it's privately owned by a corporation that is using it for providing recreational facilities and entertainment services because even if we were able to get permission to go to Skinwalker Ranch and do an on-the-ground investigation, we'd have to sign an NDA and we would not be allowed to be honest because if our investigation found that there was really nothing weird going on there, well, that would kind of hurt their bottom line and we would either have to not put out a video and waste all of our time and money, or we would have to lie to you and we don't like lying to you. And when it comes to the ranch and the stories about it, I, I am, I'm gonna say the, the alien motto, I want to believe. Not necessarily in the aliens, but that something weird is going on at Skinwalker Ranch because it would just be nice to finally have an actual location that just objectively is weird instead of there being some sort of commercialization aspect or the government getting involved and saying, no, you can't come here, like they do with a whole bunch of random spots in national parks. And as superstitious as I generally am, and the fact that I'm open to the existence of aliens and Bigfoot and dimensional rifts, and I'm also obviously religious, so I believe in various spirits and angels and demons and stuff like that, I'm, I'm skeptical on this one because the Shermans never produced any evidence of anything they claimed happened on the ranch. The Myers directly refuted what they said, saying that nothing strange happened on the ranch before they sold it, and when you look at what happened afterwards, a lot of that stuff is, uh, Bigelow didn't really find anything useful. He, he found a few weird readings, but that's about it. Whatever it was, it appears to have been enough to convince Harry Reid to launch some sort of investigation program. And the thing about that is that those files aren't necessarily all about Skinwalker Ranch. So that would just be another video entirely. And I'm happy to make that video. It's just, it's not Skinwalker Ranch adjacent. It's not related directly, so it doesn't confirm or deny anything that the Sherman said happened. And now that it's run by a, an entertainment company, essentially, it's, it's impossible to get legitimate information on it. What I would be very interested in, if this video makes its way to any Navajo or Ute individuals, I would love to know if those stories, those legends about the Navajo cursing the land, the path of the skinwalker, all of that, I would love to know if you've heard those, and if you've heard those from tribal sources, or if they came from outside, and if you wouldn't mind, if, if you have contacts, I would love to know if that is something that is actually told in those circles, because again, it is so hard to find this stuff. Additionally, if there was anything that I got wrong about the Skinwalker folklore, any Navajo, Ute, uh, people from the region, Apache, those who would know the folklore better, I would love to see your corrections if you have them. I've corrected myself on Skinwalkers in basically every single video I've talked about them, where somebody has come to me and said, hey, uh, you know, you did mostly good, but you missed this. So when it comes to this stuff, I'm absolutely willing to change how I describe it and to grow. So I hope that you can you can correct me where I need corrected. And if there's something you feel like I missed here or that I'm not considering, let us know again because we'll probably talk about aliens in the future, which will give us a chance to correct anything in this video that we got wrong. Also, if somebody could explain wormholes to me like I'm five, please do so. With all of that said, if you want to support what we're doing here at the Lore Lodge, you can subscribe to us on Patreon for just $1 a month. You can also check out our merch shop, thelorelodge.shop, for clothes and, you know, stuff that's Lore Lodge merch. You can also become a member here on YouTube. You can check out our podcast, which runs Sunday nights at 7 p.m., where we talk about this stuff, make some jokes, have a drink, it's a good time. If you want the best way to stay updated on our stuff, that is on our Discord channel. The link to that is in the description. We also have the Laura Lodge Signature Coffee, Mount Pocono Perk, and we are in a competition with our buddies over at the History of Everything podcast and Stakuyi channels to sell the most bundles of both our coffee and his coffee. For $50, you get one of each bag and a mug with each of our logos on it. It's a nice, fun way to support both channels. 
and whoever wins that competition, me or Steven, we're gonna give away an extra free bag of coffee to one of our winners. So I think that looks pretty good, doesn't it? With all that said, I'm Aiden Mattis, and thanks for stopping by the Lord Launch.